Hello, and welcome to PyMCCon. I'm Ravin, and I'm one of the organizers of PyMCCon. And what you're about to see is Ricardo's talk on automatic probability. This, however, is just one portion of Ricardo's event. If you want to take part in Ricardo's Q&A session or be a part of the community discussion, you'll find that all on the PyMC discourse, which we've linked below. If you're looking for the other events from PyMCCon, you can find those at pymccon.com, which we'll link below as well. With that, I'll let Ricardo take it away. Thanks for being a part of this event. Hello, my name is Ricardo, and I'm going to talk to you about automatic probability or how PyMC infers probabilities from random functions. You can find the slides following this link or through this QR code. Just a little bit about me. Uh, my accent comes from Portugal, in case you were wondering, and uh, I'm currently living in infamous Hungary in Central Europe. I am a core developer of PyMC and PyTensor and a full-time data scientist at PyMC Labs. You can find me on uh, GitHub or on this course. And to give you an overview, uh, my open source trajectory or career started uh, roughly in the second half of 2019, and then it has been going pretty much uh, consistently up to today. So I call this talk automatic probability as an analogy to automatic differentiation. Quoting either Wikipedia or my memory, uh, you can describe it as a set of routines to compute partial derivatives from numerical functions. This is a bit uh, uh, vague or maybe a bit dry. The important thing is that it's quite indispensable in today's machine learning ecosystem because it allows users to define numerical functions or numerical models and then make inference on them or optimize or whatever you want to call it, uh, exploiting gradient-based algorithms without ever having to define the gradient expressions or functions uh, themselves. And this is, uh, has been coined uh, differential programming. And I've, I stole this flowchart from a blog post that shows roughly what we do when we do automatic differentiation is starting from a, a, a user provided program, we try to apply you know, a bunch of simple calculus rules like the chain rule, power rule, and so on repeatedly until we found the gradient of the, the program, depending on what the user was uh, requesting from inputs to outputs. And I'll follow this analogy directly to what I'm calling here automatic probability. Again, abstractly, we can think of it as a set of routines that allow you to compute probability expressions from random functions. And uh, I would say it's indispensable in today's model-based learning ecosystem, specifically in Bayesian statistics and Bayesian learning. And it allows users to exploit probability-based algorithms like MCMC, NUTS, many things you're familiar with, without having to ever define their own probability expressions. It is analogous as been called uh, probabilistic programming. And I've uh, hacked the flowchart from the blog post to just change uh, the kind of things we do to try to infer the probabilities. In this case, using simple rules of probability like enumeration, change of variables, integration, and so on. Now, there are many flavors of uh, probabilistic programming, and I'm going to talk, be talking about the one in PyMC, where we concretely think about uh, uh, a model or a user program as a, a function of random variables and deterministic operations on these random variables. And here I'm calling something that you might find a stretch. Uh, if I call it a model, I'm defining a model of just two operations where we have an uh, x variable that follows a unit normal distribution, and we have a z variable that's just a shift of x by 5. In PyMC, we can quickly take draws from a, a model or any variables in a, in a user-defined model by calling PM draw. And the way this works behind the scenes is that for any uh, variables without inputs, uh, that are random, we will just take a, a draw from the random function, which is just a fancy way of saying that behind the scenes we call numpy random normal. And then we feed the, those draws to any operations uh, that happen downstream, like in this case, the shift by five. And uh, we can also have draws that go into other random variables as inputs or parameters. And then we just propagate those until we have evaluated every single node in the graph that the user requested. 
Now, what we can do in PIMC as well is not only take random draws, but uh, ask for probability expressions for, uh, to tell the probability of a given draw or an event condition at some part of the graph. So in this first case, let's say we want to ask what's the probability of observing a specific x from our simple model. And the way we can do that is using a PIMC log p function, which takes as input a random variable and, out, uh, and a value variable, so the value at which we want to evaluate a random variable. Uh, we work with log probabilities because that's more stable and convenient for us, but we can easily get the probability by just exponentiating, and that's what this helper function is basically doing. And we can ask the probability of x at you know, the value we drew before and uh, evaluate it. In this case, tells uh, the density is around one quarter. And we can think graphically what we did is now we derived a new computer program that takes as input x and outputs the probability of x. We could also have output uh, z again, because that's a deterministic, right? It's just x plus five. But to emphasize, uh, I just put that in dashed because what we usually care is the probability. Now we could also have asked, uh, why not the probability of observing a specific Z? And actually we can do that. So if we ask the probability of Z given the value we got, we actually get the same density back. And what happens here is a bit more interesting because Z, if you look at what it is, is an addition of a variable and a constant. So it's not something that's intrinsically has a density function, right? So PIMC has to do uh, some derivation for the first time. It has to figure out uh, what's a density for an operation. And in this case, it's not very hard. I'll walk you through it. But graphically, what happens is now we have a graph uh, where Z is the input. And we ask the probability of Z, which is somehow going to be derived by the probability of X, which we didn't ask. And again, we could have asked X as an output as well in this graph it would be a deterministic in this case. So what happens uh, looking at it in a graphical form is uh, we can think that x, if you look at the whole probability density function, look like this. And our z variable, if you want to take it as a random variable, it's something that now has exactly the same density of x, but shifted by 5. You can, uh, uh, I will just walk through. Okay, so let's say we had observed an x of 2, and uh, then we added 5, we'd have an x of 5. These two have exactly the same density, right? So we can just look at the we can just undo the 5 and then look at the density of x to compute the density of z. And we could do that the same for another node. Or more important, if you want to understand densities, it's always better to look at areas. The reason why this works is that actually we are just shifting this distribution without distorting it. So areas under the curve stay the same, which means densities stay the same. Now, this is not always the case. It's the case in the simple shift we did because it's a linear transformation, but it's not when we do something more complicated, like an exponential transformation. So here I'm doing a normal, and I'm exponentiating. I'm getting two values. Again, I can ask the probability of this, and PIMC will be happy to give it to me. But now you'll see that they are not the same, even though they map directly one to the other. And this happens because this transformation, uh, the exponentiation, distorts the original density, or the way it uh, a push a samples forward is not linear anymore. Specifically, you know, the, if we have a value to the left, it's going to be pushed somewhere between 0 and 1. 0 goes directly to 1. And values to the right of 1 are going to be pushed uh, more and more uh, to the right, closer to plus infinity as you go to larger values. More importantly, if you want to understand densities, what happens is that uh, uh, because of this uh, distortion, if we want the final uh, distribution to still be a valid distribution, it has to integrate to 1. And we have to keep the, basically, we have to account for the distortion. So if, we, if you look at a range of values, uh, you know, between, let's say, 2 or 1, 8, and 2, those are actually going to be pushed in a, and stretched. So they're going to now occupy a, an interval that has a bigger width whereas the reverse would happen to negative values. So negative values here could have a range of 1, and they would be squished between something that's smaller than 1. And we have to account for that. And that distortion gives us kind of a correction factor, which makes these densities look uh, different. So it no longer has the same height as the original ones, because it no longer has the same spread also. 
And this is just a convoluted way of explaining change of variables, probably not very well. But it's uh, basically what PIMC is doing under the hood when you ask for a probability of uh, a transformation like this. Now, I'm to show you one more example. And to make this a bit more engaging, I will not actually tell you what transformation I applied. I'll show you the density uh, we had originally and two bands of probability and how it looked afterwards and where those bands were pushed to. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about what kind of transformation could uh, lead to this uh, form of density manipulation. And the clue perhaps is that values that are slightly negative, so just roughly below zero, they became negative and large and they were stretched quite a lot. And values that were you know, somewhat positive above one became were pushed closer to zero, still on the positive side. And this is perhaps enough information or to give you a hint that what we applied here was the reciprocal uh, operation or you know, one over x. And we can indeed uh, get those probabilities as well. So here we have uh, created an inverse normal distribution. And just to remind you that we are still working with PyMC and PyMC uh, naturally supports multiple batch dimensions. I created a normal uh, with two dimensions. So these are two identical distributed normals. They are both transformed. And then I can ask the probability of these two occurrences, which roughly correspond to the value of minus 0 0.15. So this something in this band and the value of 150 or 1.5, somewhere in this band. So these were relatively simple because they were one-to-one -one transformations, meaning each value in the after the transformation can correspond to one and only one value in the original random variable. It's just we have to account when we are working with densities, we have to account for the stretching or squishing. They, this is not always the case. And the, perhaps the simplest one is the absolute transformation. So now when we push a random variable through an absolute uh, operation, and we ask, uh, what's the probability of observing three? We actually have to account for the fact that you know this three could have come from either a plus three or a minus three. And we have to basically sum the two, the two possibilities. And graphically, it looks something like this. So the probability of a value is basically the height of uh, the two cases it could come from. Otherwise, there's not really a squishing happening. And in this case, it's very simple. It's just the twice the density of the original normal distribution. And it's only simple because the normal distribution we created was centered around 0, and it's symmetrical. It's not the case if, for instance, we shifted the distribution a bit to the right. And now the density is no longer just twice the original one, because uh, you know the probability of the two cases where a value could have come from, they have relatively different uh, densities. So we have to basically add the height of these to these to get the probability of z. And just to um, not make you think that this only works with normal variables, we actually can change the random variable to be something like a Laplace. And it will work just fine when we do an absolute or any of the operations I showed you so far. And also, perhaps a silly case, uh, you can also ask the absolute of a random variable that could only have been positive in the first place. And intuitively, this shouldn't have no effect because there's no uh, ambiguity about where a value came from, could only have come from the positive side. And PIMC is clever enough to figure out that indeed the probability is not changed and it's equivalent to the original one. Now, the absolute is a, um, a case of two to one, but we can actually have many to one. For instance, uh, we can apply a clip operation. If you're not familiar what a clip does is uh, when you give an input x, any value below the lower bound, so minus one, is going to be clipped or is going to be given a value of minus one. And any value above the upper bound is going to be given the value of the upper bound. In this case, we set it to infinity, so we, that's never going to happen. What this means is that any value of x smaller than minus one is going to come out in z as having minus one. And here I just drew some, took some draws and I labeled them to just show you. So if you had an x of minus one, three, five, you get a z of minus one. But otherwise, the values are not changed. So minus 0, 5, 7 is still minus 0, 5, 7. Graphically, it looks a bit funky. So what happens is we have the original distribution. And for anything above minus one, the density of the transformation is exactly the same as the original. So if you ask you know, any value in here, we could ask, we could get the probability from evaluating it in the original density. 
but all the values below minus one they get compressed into a singular point single point of mass at minus one here denoted as a dot and if you ask what's the probability of observing minus one you have to say uh, we don't know where it came so it has to be anything in this area so we have to integrate over it fortunately this kind of integration is uh, pretty straightforward is what and it has many times closed form solutions it is known as a cumulative density function or cumulative distribution function density function and uh, we can obtain it for most distributions without having to resort to any sort of numerical uh, integration. Now, you might have heard of this kind of model that I showed you as a censoring model. And indeed, if you have used the PIMC sensor distribution, uh, you actually were basically doing the same thing we did with the clipping operation. And just to prove it, I'm creating two variables, a clip variable and a sensor that are acting on the same a uh, random variable uh, which has a size of three and now i'm uh, censoring it both below at minus one and above at two instead of infinity and i'm just going to evaluate at three interesting points so minus one uh, two the censoring bounds and the value in between and we can check that the probability is exactly the same between the two uh, random variables and visually it looks something like this Also worth noticing that uh, these uh, transformations uh, you are not, uh, or another way of saying is you are not cons uh, limited to doing a single transformation. You can actually chain multiple of these and ask for the probability of the final output or any intermediate one. So in this case, we start with a Laplace, uh, we shift it by two, and then we ask the absolute of that, and we can ask the probability of that variable. And visually, the transformations we did look something like that. So we just shifted, which we know doesn't change the density, um, kind of, or it doesn't change the height of the density. We just have to shift it. And the absolute, which does a bit of a funky effect in this case, because it has to uh, values below uh, yes. So values and uh, negative values get mapped back to positive values and it causes this kind of skewness in the distribution. And this is very neat, I would say, because it allows you to form your own random variables uh, quite intuitively by just chaining different operations on top of each other to get something. For instance, if you are looking for a prior variable, or if you are looking for a likelihood, something that matches what you expect, even though probably in the literature you will not find something like a shifted folded Laplace distribution. Okay. So you might have found it a bit of a stretch when I called uh, our two variable uh, x and z uh, um, a model. So I will now consider the case with more uh, random variables. And I will go crazy and consider two random variables at once. In our case, uh, let's say we have an x and a y unit normal uh, variables. And we have a z deterministic operation of x minus y. As usual, we can ask PIMC to draw these variables, and we get them. And more interesting is asking about the probability. And now we actually have some decision to make. We could ask the probability expression of uh, uh, y and x, or z and x, or z and y, or maybe just z, not giving any other uh, value, or all of them together. You might have thought about this, and uh, we'll get to it. So let's focus on the first three cases, which are a bit simpler to reason about. In the first case, the, the probability function that we are asking from PIMC, it's relatively simple, is basically uh, probability of y evaluated at y and probability of x evaluated at x. Z would be a deterministic function of y and x. We, again, put it as a dashed line. The two other cases are more interesting. So this what we are implicitly asking is again the probability of x because it's always an unconditional probability but now we are actually asking for the probability of z given x right because we cannot once we have x that tells us something about z and again we can combine these two information we can combine x and what we knew to be the density of y to derive the, the density of z given x and in this case is symmetrical just z given y so because we have now multiple variables and there are these questions about you know 
with respect to what are we asking probabilities, we have to use a new function. And this is the conditional log p, which you can find in a future release of PyMC, hopefully soon after this talk is released, in the module PyMC log prob basic. <coughs> I'm creating a, a helper function just because it's a, uh, the interface looks a bit different. So conditional log p uh, expects a dictionary that says for every random variable in the graph, what is the value variable, if it has one, and returns back a dictionary of the conditional probability of every uh, random variable evaluated at a given value. It's a dictionary. We ask for the expressions. Again, we exponentiate it for the point of, of this uh, talk because it's easier to think about probabilities than log probabilities. And we uh, by default, uh, create a PyTensor function that takes as input the values and outputs the probabilities. And the reason we need a function now and cannot just use eval is that we have multiple expressions. But anyway, eval was just a convenience for the point of the talk. And if you are actually interested in working with uh, these expressions directly, you should compile them to a PyTensor function. So um, when I was talking about values, what it means is we, instead of passing constants and saying, you know, evaluate x at 0, 0,9 and y at 0, 0,8, now we're going to pass dummy variables, which will just stand as a kind of a, an input that is going to be given later when you actually evaluate the function. And this is the way that conditional probability knows in your graph which, which of these three cases you were actually uh, wa uh, wanted to get. And so the first one, we can call conditional probability and pass the dictionary where we have the x random variable and the x value variable that we created here, and y and uh, y value. And then we get back a compiled function, and we can evaluate it by setting x value and y value to something. We can do the same for x and z. And here I played with the numbers in a way that we get back the same things we observed, because it, subtraction is also a linear operation. So we can get the same densities by just playing with the inputs, and uh, the same case with z and y. Now for the two last cases, which might be more interesting. So the first one, what we are asking here is, uh, let me see what we get, OK, is a function of the probability of z without knowing either y or x. So it's no longer a conditional probability. And that uh, intuitively brings us back to a case of um, um, many to one. So single z, let's say 0, could have come from many combinations, infinitely many combinations of y and x. So it could have been minus minus 1y and 1x, uh, uh, or minus 2 and 2, and so on. So to actually compute this density, we would have to convolve the two densities to find the expression of z uh, unconditional on either x and uh, y. And right now, PyMC actually doesn't give you that. And it fails out saying it could not derive z, z. OK. The reason I bring this up is to emphasize that uh, the, this functionality is still work in progress. And even cases that we want to support and we know how to support, they might not yet be implemented. So just watch out for that. And now for the last case, uh, this is interesting because it's we have an overdetermined system. So implicitly, when we if you wanted to ask the conditional probabilities of all these variables, uh, we would be asking the conditional probability of z given x and y. And this is kind of a edge case, right? Because once we know x and y, z must either um, you know, match it, which has a probability of 1, or doesn't match, which is an impossible event. And so this is a, a, an edge case. So the conditional probability of y and the probability of y and x are still unconditional. They are still well defined. And uh, actually, what you get if you try to ask for these is an error again. And this is a case where we took, let's say, programming convenience out of mathematical precision. So it's a, you could say it's a well-formed problem, but it's a, a limit case, and it would make our code more complicated to support. And I won't go over here what happens when you ask for conditional probability. But roughly speaking, when you ask PyMC to get the probability of a a transformed variable, so something that's not a pure random variable, it finds out any, it tries to look in the graph for any other random variables that don't have a value 
from which the density or the probability mass could be derived if they are connected through a simple path. And in this case, it, when it looks for uh, the sources of probability for Z, it doesn't find any because both Y and X are valued. So they're already accounted for in a sense. And you get the same error back. All right, so that was perhaps a, a bit too much nuance. And, and the multiple variables or multiple random variables are not just a headache, they are also a nice feature because once you have more than one variable, you can create many more or much more interesting graphs. So here, uh, one case you can do is control flow. And in the case of uh, probabilistic programming, stochastic uh, control flow. For instance, we can have an if-else operation depending on a stoch stochastic switch. So if the switch is on, a random variable x1 flows through. If it's off, a random variable x2 would instead flow through. And we can think of x as itself a random variable, and we can ask, what's the probability of uh, uh, an x and a switch? So before that, let me show the, ex the specific example that I'm using. And uh, also emphasize that uh, because we need the graph to make this kind of uh, probability inferences, we cannot just use Python if-else statements. Instead, we have to use symbolic expressions of these. In this case, we have to use the PyTensor if-else, which should be still pretty simple to think about. And uh, what we do is we create a switch. We call it a Bernoulli. We give it a Bernoulli, a random variable with a probability of 0, 7. And then we create x1 and x2. They are a normal centered around minus 1 and the Laplace centered around 1. And our x variable, it's a switch, uh, either x1 or x2, depending. It's an if-else. Uh, which is controlled by the switch, and it outputs either x1 or x2. And here I just took some draws just to show you that it kind of matches what you'd expect. When the switch is on, you get negative values in this case, and it's off, you get positive values because you are taking draws from the x2 instead. So now we can ask the probability for uh, observing a given x and switch. And the graphically, it looks something like this. Switch is unconditional, so it's just a probability of switch. And x is a conditional probability given a switch. And uh, the derivation is pretty simple. If the switch is on, it's the probability of uh, <coughs> x at the density of x1. And uh, <coughs> if it was off, it would be at x2. Sorry. <coughs> and we can uh, ask for the conditional probability of the twos of the two variables. And we can see uh, the first output is just an unconditional probability of switch, so 0, 7 if the value is 1, or 0, 3 if the value is 0. And uh, more interesting is the probability of x, which is higher for a negative value when the switch is on than when the switch is off, which would match intuition. Also, let me just say that the switch value variable, the dummy variable we pass to the dictionary of con conditional probability, has to be of type integer, because the Bernoulli was a a discrete variable, an integer typed variable. In general, the values have to match in both shape and type as the original random variables. Graphically, it looks something like this. If your interest of x is something like minus uh, 0, 0.9, as in our example, we would get it by uh, you know the density of x1 at that value if the switch is on, or x2 if the switch is off. Now, you might be wondering what if we don't uh, condition on the switch variable. In that case, we would want the unconditional probability of x. And the, the way we would do this would be by enumerating uh, the different scenarios for the switch and then adding the weighted probability. So if switch is off and on. Visually, it looks something like this, where now we have uh, uh, the top line shows actually the whole uh, mixture density or uh, the probability of x. And I'm just showing that it comes from the two original distributions weighted by the likelihood. So 0, 3 for the x2 and 0, 0.7 for x1. And the way we get the density is just by adding the two uh, densities that have been rescaled. Now, actually, if you ask for this kind of graph, you're also going to get an error. Right now, we don't support it in the conditional log p. In part, we are still thinking about what the API should be when a user wants to ask for conditional probabilities or uh, um, wants to marginalize variables, in a sense, or uh, ignoring the, some variables. But we've been done, doing some uh, experimental work. You can follow on PyMC Experimental. We have implemented uh, 
some subclass of the usual PIMC model called marginal model that has a handy method called marginalize, and it automatically gives you this kind of uh, probabilities for, for the variables that depend on marginalized variables. So check it out if you're curious. It's a work in progress, and I think it's uh, really uh, promising. So the last thing I'm going to talk about when involving multi multiple variables is stacking of variables. And the, the reason why you might want to stack multiple variables is that this allows you to now think of a composite variable as itself a single random variable. And this can be very convenient. So in this case, let's say we actually have a graph of three uh, random variables, x0, x1, and x2. And we stack them in a vector called xs. And now we ask, what's the probability of observing this vector of values? And what happens be behind the scenes is that this is going to give us a vector of three probabilities, x0, uh, x1, which is conditional, it's, uh, conditional dependent on x0, and x2, which is conditional dependent on x1. And in a sense, what's happening here is that we have to call this conditional log prob method inside, um, like in a nested case, inside x when we want to ask the probability of the whole vector together. It looks something like this in the PyMC code. So I'm creating three variables that are uniform. And each one is depends on the previous random variable. Uh, so the bounds are the value of the previous one up to previous one plus one. Then we stack them together. And now we can ask just uh, the probability of observing a given value of x's. And here we could have called the old method prob, but I'm just using conditional probability uh, to keep up the, the pace. And we can evaluate. And what we get is uh, you know, the conditional probability of each variable given the previous one. I thought I had, ah, I had one more slide. It got mixed. And uh, we can also ask for, uh, we can give values that are actually jointly impossible. So a case where x2 is smaller than x1 actually has a conditional probability of 0. And if we were to multiply these two, we would get the joint probability, which would be 0, because this is an impossible event. And uh, the reason I had this slide here is to emphasize that this form of stacking, it's already actually used in, in PyMC. So it's used in the time series where usually we uh, have an initial distribution that can follow an arbitrary form. And then from this initial distribution, we follow a time series that's parameterized somehow. And this is actually a stack of the initial distribution and all the innovations. And we give this back to the user as a single random variable because it's uh, usually more intuitive for users. All right. Another thing you might want to do, instead of creating all the variables uh, manually like we did, maybe you want to create them in a loop. So let's think about uh, how you might go about defining a Gaussian random walk uh, model. So you could start with a y0. Let's say it's a constant. And then we could loop through, in this case, five times. And every time we create a new y variable, that's a normal distribution with mu and sigma plus the previous value of y. We concatenate them in the ys variables, and then we just say that uh, the next uh, y, uh, the next previous y is the new y. And again, we can take draws from this uh, vector of y's and look something like that. And uh, you can also ask for the probability. I don't think I'm showing it here, but uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, this is a quite inefficient way of defining this kind of model. Because in every iteration of this Python loop, we're going to we're going to create a slightly different subgraph, but that structurally follows the same form. And actually, the final probability or the final random graph of ys is actually quite large. So in this case, it has 62 nodes. And if we were to do, let's say, 100 times more steps, we'd actually have uh, 100 times more nodes. And actually, if you try to take draws from this, PyMC is just going to hang for a while, maybe forever because its uh, computational graph is quite complicated. But procedurally, what we are doing is very simple. So what we need is a way to represent a for loop symbolically instead of with Python constructs. And the way we can do that is with uh, a PyTensorScan. 
and I will walk you slowly. The, the interface is not as intuitive as if else maybe, but it's not too bad. What we need to do is to define a function that uh, uh, outputs the variable at each iteration of the, of the loop, condition on the parameters and puts possibly previous values. So in this case, we get the arguments, which are y, the previous y, mu and sigma, and it's exactly like we had before. And then we just return the new y. And this function will be the first argument of the PyTensor scan operation. Then we need to tell you to tell it uh, whether any of the outputs should be uh, recursed back in the next iteration of the loop. So in this case, y should come back in the next iteration as y t minus one. And in that case, we also have to give an initial value, so y zero, which will be used in the first iteration. Then non-sequences uh, are the variables that don't change across iterations of the loop. And finally, we have to say how many steps we want the loop to go through. And this will return us already ys, so there's no need to concatenate the y with the previous one because that's done automatically as the output of a scan. Okay. Because we are in a probabilistic uh, programming paradigm, uh, we can uh, all the other inputs can be themselves random variables. So in our case, we'll go a bit more complicated than before, and uh, say mu follows a normal random variable, sigma is a half normal, and y0, let's just keep it as a constant. And finally, this is just a bit of a technicality, but to, we need to use a helper function to just tell uh, uh, PyMC how to update the random numbers across iterations of the loop. Okay, but once we have that, we can take draws of all the variables, so mu, sigma, and ys, and we can also ask for the probability given a, you know, a value for mu, sigma, y. We can then call the same function, and then we have a function that gives us the probability of uh, having observed uh, the probability of mu being one, sigma being two, and the y is given mu and sigma. And now, because we created it with this uh, PyTensor scan, we can go back and change the number of steps without the, graphing be the graph becoming any more complex. Uh, we can even make the number of steps itself a random variable, like we do uh, for ifelse. All right, and visually it looks something like this. What uh, the probability of a scan is, is the probability of the expression returned at each step of the function, conditioned on the on uh, any previous values and the value that we passed. So for instance, maybe in the beginning, this was a probability for the first uh, iteration, and we observed this value, this is the density. And then th this value is pushed forward, and now, uh, probability of the value at the next time point is going to be conditioned on a different distribution. All right, this is the end of the ride over PyMC ability to derive probability expressions. I hope you enjoyed it. I would just like to take a, a step back and just maybe explain why I think this is pretty cool and also a big deal for PyMC. The first obvious uh, implication of this functionality is that now PyMC has many more building blocks. We're no longer limited to just pure random variables. We can compose them, we can create new ones easily by just defining the generative graph. The way that uh, uh, you know developers and users are benefiting from this already uh, is capturing this function. So we saw sensor mixture and time series, they can be defined by different uh, random variables as input. So we don't need to create different classes for say a normal sensor or a log normal sensor. We can just use the same class and let the user specify which kind of distribution he wants to sensor. And users, they can uh, make use of this functionality uh, with a custom dist uh, class, which allows you to define a random variable by specifying what inputs you want and the function that creates the random variable graph and uh, given those inputs plus a size argument. So in this example, I'm creating two custom distributions. Uh, in this case, a shifted exponential distribution. In this case, we are shifting it by minus five and a stretched or extended beta distribution that in, can go from minus five to five. And once you have this, you can use it as any other PyMC random variable. You can, for instance, pass it to a mixture uh, if you wanted a mixture of these two components. And you can take draws, and you can take you can ask the probability. You can use it for sampling, of course. 
more generally, uh, I think this functionality makes PyMC a much more rich probabilistic programming uh, um, language because it allows you to define a generative model made of random variables and then potentially condition on any or any subset of of the nodes in this graph or of the variables in this graph. And uh, if you are familiar with, uh, uh, if you have used PyMC for a while, you may have heard that you know we distinguish between uh, random variables and deterministic operations because deterministic operations cannot be observed. And this is actually no longer true for many cases um, because of this functionality. So we're not sure yet how to bring this functionality to users, but uh, you can never you can have a look at, again, PyMC Experimental, where we implemented this observe function that allows you to say that a node in the graph is now observed. And that can be a random variable, or it can be a deterministic. And I think it's pretty cool and makes uh, gives much more flexibility to the kind of models you can write with PyMC and that you can then uh, make inference about. And finally, but not least, this functionality we implemented here, they actually have other ramifications that we are only getting started with. Mostly they allow us to now look at a, a user-defined model and reason about it probabilistically in a way that we couldn't really before. We can uh, look at the model now, do things like uh, marginalize variables or look for cases of uh, posterior conjugacy where it's much faster to get posterior draws than using the vanilla MCMC algorithms or even do some probabilistic rewrites that make the graph uh, more amenable to sample, sample to being sampled with specific samplers. This is all functionality that's still um, in, a, in its uh, infancy, so to speak, and uh, probably you're gonna see some of these things coming, uh, coming up in the next few months. Stay tuned mostly to PyMC Experimental where we are uh, you know, doing more experiments in this area, if you are interested. And uh, let me conclude by just call to uh, for you to get involved. PyMC, the PyMC lock prop submodule, which is the one where all this functionality I've been talking about is implemented, is still being actively developed. And this, like the rest of PyMC, is a community project. So if you have the time and the interest, you can get involved and you can help us uh, expanding it and making it more future complete. If you are interested, there are some, I just listed some specific ways that you could start helping today. Uh, writing documentation, we have certainly lacking in that. And I usually think that if a code is not documented or easy to find from users, it's as if it didn't exist. You can help with implementing the new features that we already have in mind. You can check for open issues on our GitHub repository, uh, look for the log probe related uh, tag. If you are familiar with other probabilistic programming languages and you have ideas of things that you think are neat or that have been lacking and you'd like to see, we are still developing this uh, uh, functionality and we are um, happy to hear your ideas. So you can discuss the API uh, with the developers. You can find us either on the GitHub or Discourse. And finally, perhaps the easiest way to help out is to try out these new features, uh, report what you found, if it worked, if it didn't, what things you will wish uh, were working because we can then uh, make use of this feedback and uh, tune or prioritize certain features. And finally, let me acknowledge uh, both the people and the institutions that have made this work possible. So first of all, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, there are two other projects that uh, where foundational work for these features that I've been talking about was done. Symbolic PyMC, which is now an archived uh, repository on the, under the PyMC developers was where m many of these ideas were first tried out. And then they were uh, first given a, a more substantial form in the APPL uh, package, which is a standalone package developed by the ISR developers, from which uh, the log prop submodule is a direct fork and extension. I've, uh, I've tried to go to Git and listed the, all the contributors of uh, these two projects plus the log prop submodule, and I've listed it here uh, by the number of commits. And so, so far, there have been 18 folks that have um, generously given their time and, uh, and skills to make this uh, functionality possible. And obviously, it wouldn't be here without them. And finally, me perso personally, I've benefited from uh, uh, grants from the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative organized with NumFocus that have partially funded some of this work. Uh, a big shout out to my employer, PyMC Labs. Uh, they have 
uh, allow me time and uh, funding to pursue some of these things more deeply. And uh, of course, thanks for all the organizers and the volunteers of PyMCCon that have made this talk uh, so easy for me to, to share with you folks. And I hope to see you around.